Well, we'll uh, turn our camera on the celebration while we try to grab somebody else. Here's Will Clark. Come here, Will. Hey, what's happening? <laughs> we did it! That's goddamn right! <laughs> you, yes! You're, you're overmodulating. Huh? No way! No way! I've been waiting a long time for this! I went to all the <laughs> amateur ones. Now we're going to the pros! Seven, I was. I had come in off the field after you know clinching down here in San Diego, and I drop a few f bombs here and there, and it was on live TV. So I learned I couldn't do that. Throughout the career of William Neuschler Clark, there wasn't much he couldn't do. And Will hits it to left field. That's hit pretty well, and it is gone. A home run for Clark to give the Giants the lead. There's no doubt that. Uh, you know, a lot of his success came from his self-confidence, you know, as a player. By the end of his career, Will Clark would become one of the most clutch players to ever play the game. He's the best pure baseball player I ever played with. Instinctively, on the base paths, in the batter's box, between the lines, he had a, a, a sixth sense that uh, was uncanny. and Clark gets it high and deep to right field. There's no statistic that can describe Will Clark's swing, but it was a thing of beauty. They had a good swing. A lot of times you say, wow, he's got kind of a Will Clark swing because Will just seemed to be the, the picture perfect hitter. And here's a base hit left field. Clark delivers, Lewis scores, and the Giants have the lead. He played the game with intensity. It would make him one of the most beloved giants of all time. The Bull Clark is unique. He's unique. He's a winner. You don't find many of them. From his childhood in New Orleans, to his college years at Mississippi State, to his days in the city by the bay, Will Clark was born to play baseball. This is Inside the Clubhouse, Will the Thrill. All this is is just a, a cricket. People like a lot of people like to fish with worms, but this time of the year we fish with crickets. Will Clark is a 48-year-old father of two, out fishing in his home state of Louisiana. He brings the same confidence and focus to angling that he did to hitting a baseball. He honed both skills growing up in New Orleans. This right here is. That's what's known as a copper nose bluegill. Otherwise, we call them brim down south. And uh, some of them are a little smaller, and then others get a little bit bigger. But this is about perfect eating size. No, I was raised, you know, with a with a mother and father that you know taught me good southern values. You know, respect your elders. Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you. Please, ma'am. You know, none of this. Yeah. No. Yeah, give me this. No, 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 that, that, that didn't fly in my neighborhood. It still doesn't fly. <laughs> One thing I remember about, about being a pitcher was, and that's probably why I'm a hitter today, <laughs> is I remember when I was up at Batters Box, just like any other little kid, I had a fear of the baseball. But yet when I was on the pitcher's mound, I used that fear for me. I used to throw it. I hit more people a game. I hit eight to 10 batters a game. <laughs> so I said, I don't think I'm going to be a pitcher anymore. Come on, play it. There you go, Preston. Now, boy, even if you do get fooled, OK, and, and you're already out in front and you're going to start to swing, instead of holding up your swing, since you're already aggressive, let's go ahead and stay aggressive. Take a full hack at it. You know, being a ball player, and Mike Kruko said it best. He said, you know, somebody handed it to you, and it's your turn to hand it down. And being a, being a major leaguer and, and learning what I learned on the job, 
it's fun to pass it down to the next generation of ball players coming up. And uh, you know, whether it's the high school level or the college level, or you know, when I go into San Francisco and work on a professional level, it's it's handing down that knowledge to to make them better ball players. Uh, did you ever play little league? Yes, I did. Uh, matter of fact, I think Bob did too. I played. Uh, I played baseball ever since I've been eight years old. And, uh, you know, if you'd have told me when I was in Little League that I was going to be in the big leagues, I'd have said, no way. But, uh, you know, it was one thing that, that I always played Little League, and, and my whole philosophy about playing Little League was to have fun. And you know what? I'm still having fun today. He knew he wanted to be a professional baseball player from a very young age. and. Really, everything he did at practice every day was designed to move the bar forward a little bit at a, at a time toward that goal. Will played the game the way a coach dreams a player should play the game. It's not just his talent, it's the way he, you know, he played the game. I think the thing about Will is he always thought bigger, too. You know, he knew some kind of way he wanted to be a Major League Baseball player. I loved it so much, it was not not a burden to me, you know, to, to go into the batting cage and take, you know, 200, 250 swings. That's not a burden for me. That's fun. I mean, I was having a ball here. Let me try this. Let me try that. You know, it's pretty cool. You know, a lot of people, you know, after about 20, 30 swings, oh, my hands hurt me, you know, I, you know, something like that. I'm just getting warmed up 20 or 30. I'm, I'm on a roll. Your life has obviously changed quite a bit from New Orleans, Mississippi State, and now the big leagues. What has changed for the better and what has changed for the worse in your life? Um, for the better, it's uh, achieving the goals that I uh, set out when I was in high school. You know, I wanted to be a major league ball player and uh, here I am and I'm probably here before a lot of people thought I should be here. Uh, I had a challenge and I, I took that challenge to heart. but. Uh, on, on the other flip side is, uh, first of all, I love my family, and uh, I had to spend a lot of time away from them, you know, but I still keep in touch with them. And uh, after that, that's pretty much about it. When you're a kid, you know, there, there's some things that you love to do. You love to go home and play out in the yard with your friends. I loved hitting a baseball. Till this day, I love hitting a baseball. When that little white thing's spinning in the air and I gotta put a bat on it, that's a lot of fun for me. I will laugh and giggle and cut up and get as serious as possible because that's what I love to do. There you go. There you go. That's better. There you go. It's almost like it's almost like when you hit a tennis ball. If you go like this, the barrel of the bat comes up and you're gonna beat it in the ground, okay? That's why you gotta stay all the way through it, okay? Boy. See? I'm also a weatherman, otherwise known as a meteorologist. They have the ultimate job security because they can be wrong all the time. Still have their job. That's the one thing about Louisiana. When it gets hot like this, I don't know what it is. It creates weather patterns where in the afternoon these little storms pop up. And it'll be gone in about 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden it'll be humid as all get out. You've been fishing your whole life? I have been fishing my whole life. Um, I was born and raised in New Orleans, and uh, on the weekends, my dad and I would go fishing. And uh, we wouldn't, this is, this is freshwater. We'd go uh, saltwater fishing, and we'd catch uh, what we call speckled trout and redfish down here. And we'd clean them, fillet them. And then that's, uh, believe it or not, my dad would, my dad actually would uh, sell them during the, during the week like people that he worked with and so that's how he made a little extra income so I grew up I grew up fishing and I grew up cleaning fish so in 1979 Will began attending Jesuit High School in New Orleans the college preparatory attended by both Will's father and grandfather would help set the foundation for the man he would become it's one of the best high schools as far as academics go. They have something silly like 56 National Merit semifinalists coming out of that school every year. 
and so I wanted to get my studies in. And uh, then at the same time, you know, I wanted to play for Coach Mizoraka and be, be a good baseball player. I, I've never seen a high school kid that could focus like Will Clark. You know, he was very, very talented kid, but a lot of, a lot of players have talent. But his focus is what separ separated him from all the other athletes. The combination of natural ability Confidence and focus would help Will break onto the varsity team as a sophomore, but he still had a lot to learn. Well, Will Clark had been on the team about three weeks, and two captains came in to see me, the co-captain, and they said, Coach, we can't get Will Clark to be quiet in the locker room. Something's got to be done. I said, send Will in to see me. So Will came in, and I said, Will, the captains tell me you're talking in a locker room. Is that true? He said, yes, sir. I said, don't we have a rule no talking in a locker room? He said, yes, sir. Called me in there and said, quit talking. Yes, sir. That's right, shut up. Okay, no problem. What I was trying to do is teach them discipline, self-control, and if they could go into the locker room without talking, when something was serious or had to be done, they would be able to do it because they taught themselves they have self-control, when to turn it on, when to turn it off. If I would not have listened to Coach Mizoraka, I promise you, when I got back home, my dad would have wailed on me. We, we had that little respect going. And I was always, respect your elders, you know? They have lived 30, 40 years longer than you have. They have a lot of experience and they're trying to pass that experience on to you. And, okay, if, if I can listen to that man and it saves me a, a whooping, I'm gonna listen to that man. I told him, all right, we talked about this today, all right? Anytime you go from the guy y'all faced the other day throwing 80, 82, okay, anytime you go up and you start facing like 88, 90, those balls that are like right here that y'all been able to get on top of, you can't swing at those no more. All right, so that's why we talked about it today. We're gonna work on this ball from belt down, all right? That's the ball you wanna hit, okay? Anything with a little juice on it, the higher it comes, you know you're gonna catch up to it. All right, so we're gonna work on the ball down tonight. Stay there, don't move. That's as high as you can swing. No higher than that. What are you doing? Get your butt up there, let's go. It, it tests your patience, I guess you wanna say. Um, it's sort of funny because, you know, a lot of the kids nowadays have no clue as to, to who you are and what you did and stuff like that. This is the thrill. That is. Yeah. They like the nickname the thrill, so they keep going, well, that thrill, well, that thrill. He's in the house. Said, yeah, y'all just like the nickname. Y'all like saying it. They have no idea what it means. The nickname Will the Thrill would not come to light until he reached the big leagues something he could have done right out of high school. I got not only recruited by a bunch of schools, but also got drafted. I was a fourth round draft choice out of, by Kansas City. Uh, same draft as Brett Saberhagen. And uh, I had never been away from home. Uh, I didn't think I was mature enough to get into that pro life yet. And, and I actually wanted to go and experience college. Went to Mississippi State, I didn't start as a freshman and the first baseman got hurt and it was a doubleheader against Auburn and first at bat, whack. Never looked back, didn't lose my toe hold. On his way to becoming a two-time All-American at Mississippi State, Will couldn't pass up the opportunity of a lifetime when the International Olympic Committee made baseball a demonstration sport for the 1984 Olympics. I love the challenge. I mean, I really do. If there's if there's something that I want to shoot for, and I, that's my goal, I am 
a thousand percent committed to it. And at that time, you know, I wanted to be on the Olympic team. I wanted to run out there, you know, with USA written on your chest. To identify the best amateur players, 63 open one-day tryout camps were held at college campuses across the country. The tryouts were at Ole Miss. There was one job coming out of that camp, and I wound up going in there. I was three for four that day with two homers, and I was the one guy that they chose. Then they brought us to Louisville, Kentucky, and there was 44 guys that they invited to Louisville, Kentucky. And then from those 44, they trimmed it to 25. And then from that 25, we went on tour. And we played 36 games in 32 days in like 35 different cities. In the 1984 Olympics, Will joined the 20-man roster of the best amateur baseball players in the country. To prepare for the competition, Team USA took part in a grueling seven-week training tour. During batting practice in the Astrodome, Will Swing caught the attention of then Astros president and chief operating officer, Al Rosen. I remember sitting in my office and I hear this whack, whack, and when you've been around as long as I have, you, this, you can hear the difference in the sound of the bat. And I was listening to this and I had to go out and see who was hitting. And I see this skinny kid watching him take batting practice and I thought to myself, Oh, if I were ever lucky enough to get him. Matt, Matt, hit one out here for Finney. This ball out here is the perfect one for you to go ahead and spin. Two, all right? Because it keeps your weight going that way, all right? If your weight's going that way, you're going to be more accurate. When you turn and you spin like this, you're coming away from the play. Yes, sir. All right, we want to go towards the play. Yes, all right. Uh, one of the things that I remember about that team was how many people sort of uh, played out of position. Uh, you know, Barry Larkin was basically a backup. You know, Corey was at third base. So, you know, it just seemed like guys who made it to the major leagues and became stars at certain positions, that wasn't that position on the Olympic team. Barry Larkin was our shortstop. Uh, Corey Schneider, who was a former giant, was our third baseman. Uh, Bobby Witt was a pitcher. Scott Bankhead was a pitcher. All of these guys were major leaguers, by the way. Oda B. McDowell was a center fielder. Chris Gwynn, Tony Gwynn's brother, was our right fielder. Mark McGuire was our first baseman. I actually played left field in DH. The talent-laden U.S. Olympic team would eventually lose to Japan in the gold medal game. But the name Will Clark had become nationally known. Oh, yeah, gosh, we'd heard of him, and, you know, even before he got to, before he even signed with us. Uh, he, when he was with college, and then on the, especially on the Olympic thing, he was such a driving force. One of the Giants scouts that I had known ever since I was in high school was a guy by the name of Squeaky Parker. And Squeaky Parker drafted quite a few Giants that made it to the big leagues. And uh, so I had had dealings with him for three years before I got drafted by the Giants. And, uh, you know, the guy that we talked about, John Barr, who's the head of our scouting department now, he was a, a younger scout back then. And he, he tells a story about jumping a fence to come watch us take batting practice and stuff like that. So it was a different era back then. Will Clark. Well, he was picked number two today by San Francisco Giants, not only for his bat, but his defensive skills, and he's got a good arm. Oh! That to me, he wants respect defensively. I know uh, Coach Ron Polk told us down in Starkville that uh, uh, some of the scouts said, well, can he play the outfield? And Coach Polk says, hey, what are you worried about the outfield, the way he can dance at first base? Yeah, I got drafted by the Giants, and I just so happened to be in the College World Series. We were playing Arkansas that day. I got drafted in the morning. I was really elated. I was really ecstatic. But then, as you said, I had a goal. I had College World Series I had to do. And goes fastball. He goes the other way with it to deep left field. There that night, I was three for four with a homer and four RBIs, and 
We beat Arkansas that night, so that was a pretty solid day all the way around. Uh, Al Rosen and I, the scouts that told me, said, this guy's something special. Where do you see him play and all this? And, and they were right. I show up in, in San Francisco. Will Clark is there. He was a tremendous addition to a ball club. If you had 25 Will Clarks, you'd never have to worry about winning. On part two of Inside the Clubhouse, Will the Thrill. Anybody got tea about that high? I'm confident. Off the charts. It is out of here. The Astros, we look over their dugout, they had the same look on their faces that we had. It's like, who the hell is this guy? I walked out there to kick your ass every day. I wanted to beat you. Don't be afraid to hit a homer and throw a no-hitter. There you go. That's how you win. After that day, Greg Max and every other pitcher now talks like this. This has been an exclusive presentation from SFG Productions.